اللهم ارحمني برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين <تصفيق> الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد Up till now we've covered Sirat al-Mustaqeem the importance of being guided, importance of being on the right path, importance of being with Iman, with true beliefs and with true actions. To attain this, the first thing we mentioned was to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continuously beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the straight path. Then the Quran instructs us that the straight path is the path of the pious people, the prophets, the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored. Then mentioned uh, we mentioned or we discussed some things which take a person out of the straight path or misleads a person on his journey of the straight path. And one of the most important things which numerous of our peoples, especially the youngsters, are faced with is self-study, relying on one's own knowledge, intellect, understanding, of the Quran and Hadith and there are numerous scholars who have opened the doors for the awam. I mentioned the importance Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi Ali. I just like to repeat that as it's a very very important and poignant point that Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi Ali says for an normal person for a non-scholar it is better that he commits major sins like stealing or adultery than that he has a habit of self-study that he starts discussing starts talking about the quran hadith muslim asail and other aspects of the religion without knowledge, without the foundation, and without the scholarly support of the Sahaba, of the Tabi'een, and the true scholars, the guides that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent for this ummah. This is better for them. And then he gives an example. A person di dives into a deep ocean, dives into the sea, and he doesn't know how to swim. The only outcome is going to be that he's going to drown and he's going to die and he's going to destroy himself. So the very, very important point is we stick to the scholars. I also mentioned that numerous ahadith, the Quran tells us that we have to follow the majority. The Prophet ﷺ mentions that stick with the majority. And then I give an example of the majority Sunnis against the minority Shias, the majority Sunnis against the minority Qadianis. So to understand the straight path, to understand the true, the, the true way, we look at the Quran, we look at the Prophet ﷺ, his lifestyle, and then we look at what happened after the Prophet ﷺ left the world, the path adopted by Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the Khulafai Rashidun, the four rightly guided Khulafa successors, leaders of the Ummah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed the Ummah to stick to the four rightly guided Khulafa, to look at their lifestyle and to follow them, emulate them, and therein lies the, the, the true and the straight path. Then we move on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the ages, especially after the Sahaba, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Islam and Muslims political power. Numerous dynasties were created and from the time of the first dynasty, the first, you could call it a dynasty, the Banu Umayyah, then moving on to the Banu Abbas and all the way till the destruction of the or the the, dem the <coughs> demolition destruction of the Ottoman Empire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the ages in numerous different parts of the world Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created different empires different kings and some of them are very very good some of them helped to spread Islam strengthen Islam some of them not so good some of them were good in certain aspects and were bad in certain aspects because we are discussing about Shawaliullah Muhaddis Dehlwi Rahmatullahi Ali just a, a small diversion that how Islam came to the Indian Peninsula or the Indian subcontinent in the time of the Sahaba the Sahaba whilst the Islamic Empire was expanding militarily Iran Iraq Azerbaijan Lebanon Egypt all these countries whilst the Muslims were fighting the Sahaba were spreading the world of Islam and destroying the Persian Empire the Roman Empire the and all the, uh, all the forces that were arranged against them whilst the Sahaba were completely destroying them their cultures and spreading Islam and spreading the word of Allah the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the borders of China on one side and to all the way to Morocco and North Africa etc there <coughs> there were also Sahaba who were traders and they used to travel in the Arabian Sea and they used to travel the world from from Jeddah and they used to go and ply their trade some of these Sahaba history tells us they came to uh, in Gujarat there's a small area called Baruj there there was a port at Kavi similarly in Pakistan India at that time there were ports in Karachi so these Sahaba these traders they would come they would uh, <coughs> obviously with them they would bring their Islam they would teach the Islam and without military means just through their practices just through their through their character the Sahaba managed to spread Islam in different parts of the world. In 2004, an uh, earthquake took place which led to the tsunami. I visited Indonesia and uh, the, the hardest part <coughs> of Indonesia that was hit was a place called Banda Aceh. Banda Aceh was a very, very religious area other rest of the separate from rest of Indonesia in the sense that they and the people themselves and the government they adopted a semi or semi Islamic government the dress code and the laws and every everything they were they tried to establish uh, according to Islamic principles Anyway, when the earthquake came, I visited it about four times, taking aid and then buying land and building houses through the support of Muslims of Preston, Bolton, Butley and other places. There, the people told me, I asked them about the history of how India came to Indonesia. So they said that traders from Baruch, they came and Muslims from Baruj, they came, they landed in Bandaje, and 
from there, the people started accepting Islam and over the years, it spread throughout Indonesia. That is why it's a well-known fact that when people accuse Islam of being spread by the sword, so the question is always asked, the whole islands or the whole of Indonesia, Malaysia, these were not spread through the sword. These people accepted Islam after having, coming into, after having come into contact with the Muslims, liking their lifestyle, liking their beliefs, and then adopting Islam, accepting Islam, adopting the Islamic way. And before we knew it, Alhamdulillah, all of the, the, the whole of the peninsula. There had been others, other, uh, other means as well, I'm not saying that Bandache was just the, from there, but uh, the people of Bandache, the, they told us that Islam in Bandache, which was the strongest Islamic um, state in Indonesia, is that the, it, that Islam came from the traders, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, Tabi Tabi'een, and it didn't, it didn't give me a year, but they said that uh, that's how Islam first came into Indonesia through the traders of Baruch. Anyway, Islam spread peacefully, militarily. How did it come to India? Obviously, the well-known youngster, Muhammad bin Qasim. Muhammad bin Qasim was a nephew of Hajjaj bin Yusuf. Hajjaj bin Yusuf, despite his uh, brutality, a group of Hujjaj, men and women, they were traveling from India to Makkah Mukarrama for Hajj. They were traveling by ship and at that time I believe Karachi was under a uh, Hindu, Hindu Raja. Anyway, this Hindu Raja, he accosted the ships, he got control of the ships and he took all the Hujjaj prisoners. One of the ladies, she wrote a letter and managed to get it through to Hajjaj bin Yusuf where she complained that, you know, you have such a strong empire, you have such a strong military force, but your Muslim sister or your Muslim brothers and sisters are accosted on their journey to Hajj. So Hajjaj bin Yusuf, in short, he sent his uh, young nephew, Muhammad bin Qasim, to, to, to the area of Sindh. And he sent him with an army. And uh, my, my purpose isn't to you know, go through history, but Hajjaj bin Yusuf, I mean, sorry, Muhammad bin Qasim, he was very, very successful. He was very young. Some people put his age at 17, some at 19, 20, whatever. But he was a very, very young, but he was trusted with an army. He went and Alhamdulillah, he managed to free the Hujjaj and he managed to conquer that area. So Islam came to <coughs> the Indian Peninsula or Islam came to India through different means. Then we also learn about one of the great men of Allah, one of the, what we call Allahu yashtabi ilayhi man yasha, the chosen people, Allah, Allah chooses certain people towards him, towards his religion. So one of these was Hazrat Khaja Mohidin Chishti Rahmatullahi Alayhi, Ajmeri. Hazrat Khaja Mohidin Chishti Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he was a youngster, very pious, very deep into his, uh, uh, his rituals, he became, or he took the bait, <coughs> he took the oath of allegiance, the bait, to his Sheikh Khaja Uthman Haruni. Then Khaja Muhyiddin Jashri Rahmatullahi Ali, he moved to, he went for Hajj, and then he went to the holy city of Medina, the, the city of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khaja Muhyiddin Chishti Rahmatullahi Ali, he went with the intention of Hijrat, he wanted to settle in Medina Munawwara, but he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the dream, he's telling him that I want you to go to this place. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him verbally 
that I want you to go to a place called Ajmer in India. He woke up, he hadn't heard of Ajmer, so he asked the people in, in Medina who were from India or who knew something about India, asked them that, do you know a place called Ajmer? And then the next night, he saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again in the dream. This time, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam showed him on the uh, <coughs> showed him on the map where Ajmer was situated. Anyway, two or three times he saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed him that you need to go to this place. And the similar things like these have happened to other people. The Amir of Tabliq, Walana Ilyas. <coughs> He also went to Medina Munawwara with the intention of wanting to reside there, wanting to stay there, the, with the intention of Hijrah from India. And there, he, the Prophet ﷺ instructed him, whether through a dream or whether through a muraqaba, that you need to go back to India, work will be taken from you. Now, Hazrat Mawani Ilyas, he was a very, very, we would call, he was a very quiet and insular person. And he had a, a slight speech, a, a slight defect. Wasn't really noticeable, but uh, he had a slight uh, speech defect. So he told his nephew, Hazrat Sheikh Zakaria Kandelvi Muhajir Madani, Nawarallahu Marqadahu. He told his nephew that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling me to go back to India and work will be taken because I, I, what can I do? I'm not a, I don't, I, I can't give speeches and I've already taught kitabs. So what, I mean, Every person themselves, they feel as if they are not worthy. And that is, a, that is a trait of the great scholars, where they regard themselves as lowly and as not worthy of the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. Hazrat Shaykh Rahmatullahi Ali, just listening to a bayan by our Hazrat, Hazrat Mawlana Yusuf Sahib Nabarallahu Marqadahu, where Hazrat says that regarding Hazrat Shaykh Rahmatullahi Ali, that uh, in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا تفضلوني على Yunus ibn Matta alayhi salam. That uh, don't, don't uh, make statements where you put me above Hazrat Yunus alayhi salatu wa salam. In other words, don't make statements like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is better than Yunus ibn Matta. Uh, so the student asked the Shaykh that uh, Hazrat, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is best of mankind. He is the leader of the angels and the prophets and he is the leader of both worlds, this world and the hereafter. So how can the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that he is not better than Hazrat Yunus, uh, uh, <coughs> Yunus Alaihi Salaam? So the Shaykh Rahmatullahi Alaihi said that, okay then. What do you think of me? He said, first, Hazrat Shaykh Rahmatullah he said, this is how the people, or this is the people blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how they talk. In other words, they never big themselves up. They don't praise themselves. They don't allow any type of uh, praise with their own tongue. So then, as the Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali asked this, uh, the students that, do you understand? They said, no, we don't understand. As the Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali explained again, that the big people, this is how they say it. So then, the students said, we still don't understand. And as the Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali asked them, okay, then what do you think of me? So they said, well, obviously, we think, we think of you as our teacher, our mentor, one of the greatest scholars. We think of you as a Buzru, a Urdu word of a very, very high caliber. So as the Shaykh Rahmatullah he said, this is what you think of me, but I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah on the face of the, 
on the face of the earth, there is no one lowlier and there is no Muslim lowlier and worse than me. So as the Shaykh Rahmatullahi Alayhi, about himself, he says, he used to say with a qasam, with conviction, that he, regards, he regarded himself as the worst of the Muslims. And these type of statements ought to be found in numerous of our kabir. Hazrat Tanvi Rahmatullahi Alayhi used to say that I regard myself as worst of the Muslims and regarding the kafirs, regarding the non-Muslims, he says, I don't know whether they'll die on Iman or on Kufr. If they were to die on Iman, then they are better than me. And if they were to die on Kufr, on, if they were to die as non-Muslims, then obviously I am better than them because the Quran has differentiated the believers and the non-believers. So Hazrat Mawani Elias Rahmatullahi Ali, he's been instructed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to return to India. The work will be taken from you. But he himself regards his own efforts, his own abilities as lowly and he has no confidence in the fact that he would be up to the task. So he mentioned this to his nephew, Hazrat Sheikh Zakaria, Muhajir Madani Nawarallahu Marqadahu. So Hazrat Sheikh Rahmatullah told him that, listen, the wording of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, when he instructed you, was work will be taken from you. The words weren't go back, go to India and work. So whoever is going to take the work from you will take the work from you. You just go back to India. So he returned back to India and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started the work of Tablighi Jamaat, which we know now literally almost 100 million Muslims or more have been into this work. Anyway, so similarly, Hazrat Khaja Muhyiddin Chishti Rahmatullahi Ali, he traveled to Medina Munawwara with the intention of staying there, migrating to Medina Munawwara. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed him to go to a place called Ajmer in India. Anyway, he came there in his own biography. If somebody wants, they can relearn that uh, he came there, then he was accosted by the, uh, by the rulers and they, they tried to uh, imprison him and numerous, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed numerous uh, karamat on his hands. And it is said that when, he, and then he started spreading the word, of, uh, the word of Allah, spreading the word of the Quran, spreading Islam. And then people started accepting it. And then they, they spread so much that it is said all, almost 9 million people. No way, lack. 9 million people had accepted Islam when he left the world. After w working for 40, after propagating Islam for 40, 50 years in India. So one aspect, or another way that Islam entered India or the Indian subcontinent was through these scholars, through these saints, as we call it, through these buzrugs, through these awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through these men of Allah who Allah had favored. And these were the, Suf the Sufiya. Inshallah, when the time comes, when Shah Waliullah Muhammad Dalwi rahmatullahi alayhi, one of his greatest things was he was a great Sufi. He was a Sufi master of the Naqshbandi order. And inshallah, when, the, when we get into the life of Shah Waliullah Muhammad Dalwi rahmatullahi alayhi, we'll, we'll explain a bit more about the Sufi orders. So numerous ways Islam came to India. There was a great king, a great sultan, uh, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi. Ghazni was a place in Afghanistan and Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi was the ruler and he started sending or he himself came with armies into India, into Gujarat especially and he started conquering parts of India, defeating the Hindu Rajas and he was a very very powerful and he was very very successful in his mission and endeavor of taking Islam to India. In India, in Gujarat, there was a, there was a mandir of Somnath and that was like the center 
for millions of Hindus. And uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi, he conquered lands all the way up till Gujarat, all the way until he got to Somnath. The people in the Mandir, the, the Sadhus and the Rajas, and they all got together and they sent a delegation to Mahmoud Ghaznavi that uh, will give you such and such amount of money, but uh, please don't attack us and don't break our idol, which has been standing there for thousands of years, and we'll pay you X amount of money. Now, Mahmoud Ghaznavi was known as Budshikan, the breaker of idols. So Mahmoud Ghaznavi, Sultan Mahmoud Ghaznavi, he answered that, listen, I have been labeled as the breaker of idols. My mission is to spread Islam and what we, Islam, the main thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only God, is the only sovereign, is the only king, is the only, only Lord, only God worthy of being worshipped. And my mission is that any on all false religions, all false gods, then I am going to destroy them. So anyway, Mahmoud Ghaznavi, he refused to take the money. Then with his army, he managed to conquer the mandir, the, uh, the idol. Then when they broke the idol, they saw that uh, the money that they, have, they were being offered over the centuries, money had been obviously <coughs> put as a sacrifice or money had been donated to the idol, which and when they collected the gold and the silver and all the, all the money that came out, they, they, they realized that it was so much more than what the Hindus had been or the, the Rajas had been offering him. So another way that Islam entered, uh, <coughs> Islam entered India was through these, uh, these, these sultans and people who came to India with their armies with the intention of spreading Islam. Anyway, this all took place, you would say, in the first thousand years. Then Islamic um, dynasties were already established in India. There is a whole line of them. But uh, the Mughal, at the time of Shah Walila Muhammad the Alvi, the, the dynasty that was prevalent or that was ruling majority of India or the parts where Shah Walila Muhammad was stationed in Delhi was the Mughal. The Mughal, the Mughal Empire, they started with a person called Zahiruddin Muhammad, better known as Babur. Babur, he came from Uzbekistan and uh, there's a, he, he has his own biography. He actually wrote one of the only kings to write his autobiography. Anyway, Babur came, he ruled for four years, then he passed away around 47 years of age. Then his son, Humayun, he became the leader. Humayun was defeated. Then he returned to Uzbekistan and that area. Then he came back with the help of the Iranians. And then he took over, once again, he took over Delhi and his, the, the surrounding areas. Then after Humayun came his son, Akbar. Akbar, one of the longest, he ruled for almost 50 years or, or over 50 years. Akbar, he himself was, a, was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. He became a king at a very young age, about, I believe he was about eight, uh, sorry, 11, 11, 12 years old when he became the ruler. Then Akbar, he was greatly influenced by the Hindus and also by the Shias from Iran. Certain Iran sent their top scholars to the court of Akbar and after some time, Akbar, he claimed or he, he was so powerful that he thought that I am 
powerful enough to create my own religion. And in that, what he wanted to do was what he called deen ilahi meaning that uh, the godly religion, that all get the best parts of all religions. Pantheism, I think, I believe is called. Anyway, you get, uh, get parts of all the, be- all the best parts of the religion and uh, adopt that and make that uh, the religion of the, of the state. So anyway, there was a scholar, Sheikh Ahmed Sarhindi, Rahmatullahi Ali, who opposed Akbar and he wrote letters advising Akbar's close people, advising the people as a whole, advising his, his disciples, his students, the scholars, and uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sarhindi, one of the greatest scholars. Some people regard after uh, after Khaja, um, sorry, um, yeah, Pirani Pir, Shah Abdul Qadir Jilani, Rahmatullahi Ali, as the leader of all the pious people, and they used to regard Sheikh uh, <coughs> Ahmed Sarhindi, who was given the title of Mujaddid al Fithani, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a hadith that at the end or at the beginning of each century, the Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala brings out a reviver. This person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gives him the knowledge, gives him the understanding, and this person, whatever whatever weaknesses and whatever false things have entered the Sharia in the past century, this person, he cleans it out. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him, Man yujaddidu hadha deen, who's going to revive this religion. So throughout history, we've had numerous, Islam has had numerous revivers. The first revival was uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the Khalifa of the Banu Umayyads. Then throughout the centuries, we find for each century, either one reviver or according to some people, it's not limited to one person. Numerous people could be the revivers of that century. So Sayyid, uh, sorry, Sir uh, <coughs> Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi, Rahmatullahi Ali, he is regarded as the reviver of the, the millennia, the thousand years from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the time of Akbar and to the time of Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi, especially over the years, the cultural and non-Islamic things which had entered Islam. So throughout the ages, the revivers would clean and would take out these cultural and non-Islamic things from the general Islamic, from the religion of Islam. Sir, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi, Rahmatullahi Alhi, he is regarded as the reviver of the, of the whole century. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took great work from Sheikh uh, <coughs> Ahmed Sir Hindi, Mujadid al Fathani, Rahmatullahi Ali. And he was uh, uh, a few, about a century before Hazrat Shah Walila Muhadid Dalvi, Rahmatullahi Ali, came on the scene. So these, the likes of Khaja Munin Chishti, Rahmatullahi Ali, and numerous Sufiya, they brought Islam, they worked amongst the people. And they spread Islam, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through the Sufi practices, Sufi orders. And uh, alhamdulillah, through them, millions, hundreds of millions of Muslims, they benefited and they accepted Islam. Then, after Akbar, so anyway, so where we find here is that at the time of Shah Walilah Muhadid Dalvi Rahmatullahi Ali, the political situation was very, very volatile, very fragile, very fragile. We learn that, that this is the time when Hazrat, uh, at the time of uh, Shah Walilah Muhadid Dalvi Rahmatullahi Ali, the 
one of the greatest empires is the Ottoman Empire, Khilafat al-Uthmaniya. And Shah Waliullah Muhammad al-Dalbi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he traveled to Makkah Mukarramah, Medina Munawwara, which was under Ottoman rule. But the Ottomans at that time, we're talking about the early 18th century, 1700s, the early part of the 1700s. So we learn that uh, during Azza Shah Walila Mahdalwi's lifetime, five kings had worn the crown for, for the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, its, uh, its beginning was miraculous, where a band of 600 warriors, they were migrating, they were traveling, they saw that uh, there's a battle going on and they realized that uh, one group was very small in number and the other was large in number. So they joined the smaller group, the underdogs, and with their help, they managed to defeat a far larger army. Then the, the Sultan of that time, the king of that time, he gave them land around Sogut and and this is obviously where we get the Ertugrul and Uthman and all the, the, the things that we are being shown. So this is the beginning of uh, the Ottoman Empire, where it was only through a handful, 600 people is nothing. But uh, through them, Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them military power and they spread. And the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he prophesied that... Uh, uh, that uh, Constantinople will be conquered and uh, it, this came under Mahmud al-Fatih which is uh, another story altogether so now the Ottoman Empire it was it had lasted for 600 years how it lasted and everything it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible history incredible story but uh, at the time of Shah Walila Muhammad Dalvi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, it was, you could say, in decline, where they were being faced with numerous problems. They were facing the Russians, they were facing the Europeans, and worst of all, they were facing internal strife, where the Muslims themselves were becoming an obstacle. Muslim governors, Muslim leaders, they themselves were becoming or the other Muslim governments, other Muslim empires outside the Ottoman control where they were, the Ottomans were facing a lot of opposition from these people which led to a weakening of the Ottoman state. Then we find that uh, at the time of Shah Walila Muhammad Alwi Rahmatullahi Ali. Shah Walila Muhammad Alwi Rahmatullahi Ali was born in 1702. And he passed away in 1761. Islamically, he was 1114 after Hijri. And he passed away in 1176 after Hijri. Shah Walila Muhammad Alwi Rahmatullahi Ali. Now, he was born in 1702. And four years or five years later, in 1707, Aurangzeb had died. So the harms that Akbar had done to India, India to Islam, to the Indian Muslims. So his son, I believe he was Jahangir. So his son, he managed to root out a lot of the Hindu customs, a lot of the Shia customs and those people that had influenced Akbar. Some of them so-called Muslim scholars who had basically tried to destroy Islam, bring up their own religion. So then in the then Aurangzeb, later on Aurangzeb became the ruler. He ruled for almost 50 years and the life of Aurangzeb, inshallah, will be holding 
uh, a session, a few sessions on the life of uh, Aurangzeb. But Aurangzeb was one of the most powerful, one of the most successful rulers of India. And he was a very, very pious person. Obviously, nowadays, those people who are anti-Islamic in their thinking, they come out with numerous accusations and try to portray Aurangzeb as an evil ruler, as a bad ruler. But in truth, Aurangzeb was one of the most pious, one of the greatest. And we could say that uh, from the list of those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored, and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told the ummah to follow, Aurangzeb would come under one of those, especially his uh, military prowess, his military successes. Despite all that, his piety, he would not take a penny from the public purse. He would write Qur'ans, he would make cap stopies, he would sell them, and then he would eat, and his, his sustenance was works that he'd, he would do from his own hands. It's incredible, incredible uh, story, incredible history of Aurangzeb. But by the time Shah Waliullah Muhammad was born, these were the final years of Aurangzeb. And like Salahuddin Ayyubi, incredible person, incredible ruler. But as soon as he left the world, his heirs and his, follower, uh, his, his children, they went up to the task of holding on to the kingdom, the empire that Salahuddin Ayyubi Rahmatullahi Ali had carved out for, the, for them. Similarly, the successes of Aurangzeb, they were unable to never mind keep intact. They were unable to follow in the footsteps of Aurangzeb. They were unable to maintain the power and the prestige and uh, the the strength of Islam which Aurangzeb had left for them. So unfortunately, as soon as Aurangzeb left, his successes, numerous successes came in the lifetime of um, Shah Walila Muhammad Alvi Rahmatullahi Ali. And these people, and Shah Walila Muhammad Alvi Rahmatullahi Ali, he was faced with these numerous people attacked Delhi. It is said that five times in the life of Shah Walila Muhammad Alvi Rahmatullahi Ali, Delhi was attacked and completely uh, ransacked and completely destroyed. So, next, uh, ne next time, inshallah, we'll just go into a bit more detail of the, the ruling classes or the Mughals or the people in charge and the, the opponents and the enemies faced by the Mughal emperors at the time of Shawlila Muhammad Alvi Rahmatullahi Alayhi and his, uh, at the time of his life. وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Yeah, it's just right.